Welcome to the I Lit With Podcast, episode number five. I'm Dr. James Kundart. I'm Dr. Len Hua. And it's been a while since we've talked to you, but today we have a couple of topics. Uh, it is currently mid-September and uh, still sunny uh, in the nice. Northwest. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would like to talk about one medical thing and one maybe a little less medical thing, one more refractive thing today. What's this a picture of, Len? This is actually, what, a mild papilla edema, swelling of the optic nerve? Is there a difference between papilla edema and optic nerve swelling? Well, if you like have like just one eye swelling and then you more of a neuritis, when you have both of the eye got swelling, then you tend to call it papilla edema. All right, and we can only see one eye here, so it remains unknown to us about what's going on. But you can follow that link if you want and find out more about this particular patient from the University of Iowa. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what can cause this. Sometimes it's bad stuff, right? Yes, and, and yeah, and this is just kind of an episode to just kind of update uh, a little bit about idiopathic intracranial hypertension, so that kind of cause uh, papilla edema swelling of the no- nerve in both eye, but you really don't know what, what's the cause to it. So is this the same thing as pseudotumor cerebri? Yes, in a sense, yeah. Uh huh. And as you can see, there's some possible trigger that have been associated with this, and they are. Yeah. So, so I see a bunch of medications there. So, are you saying this is something that we doctors cause? It could happen. Yeah. Uh, there have been finding that, like, for instance, patient who's taking uh, Accutane for acne or tetracycline class of drug uh, have been associated with nerve. Swelling. Oh, you can hear somebody's car is in, in a landmark, right? Yeah, it is. I guess I could shut a window or two, but, but no, I've heard and I see something about weight loss there. I mean, isn't it true that most patients with pseudotumor uh, are overweight? Uh, in, in, in school, you have learned like what? Fat, female, 40, kind of thing. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the insulting mnemonic for remembering it, right? <laughs> it yeah. is, it is. But then there's, yeah, yeah some, some high association that uh, with uh, weight gain. I mean, obese, uh, over the way, o- overweight uh, can, can uh, kind of probably uh, slow down the drainage of the CSF from the brain and, and that increase the intracranial pressure. And, and the fact that oral contraceptives can lead to this condition would predispose females. I, I do work with pediatrics, and I can tell you that the overweight thing applies to pediatrics with pseudotumor, but the, uh, the male-to-female ratio among kids is equal. So cool. that's a good mm-hmm. thing for practitioners to know. So I see that, that uh, there's at least one oral medication that a lot of optometrists may be legally able to prescribe. There's uh, cetazolamide on the list. There. Yes, Diamox, yes, yes. Two grams is a lot, though, isn't it? Yeah, over three doses. So initially, you probably will start at a low dose, and you're slowly increasing low do- dose depending on, on patient's kind of reaction and side effects. So it's about it. a 750 milligram dose, give or take, you know, yes. to, to get to yes. the... Yes, yes. Yeah, so... All right, so and, and uh, I guess I, I've, I've found out the hard way that patients with a sulfa allergy will break out in hives if you put them on Diamox. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Diamox is, is, is related to sulfa. So, so some patients, if they're allergic to sulfa drug, then uh, Diamox is not the way to and, go. And that may be the way you find out. <laughs> that, that may be the way, way you find out. But uh, the, the main thing, because Diamox is, in a sense, it's a diuretic. So it works on like the proximal loop of, of the uh, nephron uh, of the kidney. So you, in a sense, I mean, if Diamox is not um, good for a patient who has allergy to sofa, furosemide, which is a loop diuretic, may be used in place. And it, that's the uh, generic name of that drug? Uh, that's the generic uh, name. That's the, yeah. And the brand name would be Lasix. Yes. yes. Not to be confused with Lasix surgery. Exactly. So, so. Uh, from what I heard, you had like a a, a a patient recently that you would yeah the, yeah that's that's right a, a patient of mine that that does not have pseudotumor but has nystagmus secondary to Arnold Chiari malformation where in the cerebellar tonsils get pinched in the foramen magnum of the skull uh, between the medulla and the skull itself and uh, this condition it causes positional nystagmus of the head and I probably lost half the audience on that but but in any case she has eye symptoms and the only thing that was relieving it for her was uh, acetazolamide, but we found out again the hard way with no permanent damage done, though, that, that because of hives, that acetazolamide was a functional drug but was not pleasant because of the side effect of the hives in her case, looking for a replacement drug, and you recommended that we try Lasix. So, yes. Yeah, so fluorosamide is a, is a good option there. Probably better than getting a spinal tap. Yeah, so so at the moment, the, the current treatment paradigm for, for papilledema 
uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is actually a lumbar puncture as part of the diagnosis and but uh, the part of the diagnosis procedure but it also helped in terms of relieving the pressure and treatment for for the problem uh, weight loss don't need to much to to be much at all about five to ten percent seems to to work pretty well and then one quick update is that, that actually there's a plan for uh, a clinical trial to, to compare a treatment with Diamox versus other uh, regimen like in the idiopathic intracranial hypertension treatment trial. So we will look forward for new information, actually a randomized trial and, and to help guide in treatment of this condition. I've certainly seen these patients that, that are relatively asymptomatic or have vague kind of asthenopia symptoms and uh, you get to your exam and you're thinking it's maybe a mild refractive error, refractive error change until you look in the back. And yes. so uh, yes. their visual field will often have a large blind spot. But uh, other than that, they, they may not be strongly aware that this is going on. And some are symptom free entirely. True. Yeah. True. So, so, so it's good, good to, to know. Yeah, so when you see those fuzzy it. borders on the nerve, uh, you know, the, take them seriously. I, uh, remember things like autoimmune diseases can cause optic nerve swelling as well. Um, and so that's uh, something to look for. And remember some of the medication they take too. So yeah, okay, let's. So so now that we still talking about visual field, let's just move on to visual field and a common myopia. Hi, yeah, myopia. yeah. We, I think all of us have been in practice for a while. Have seen myopic staphyloma, as you can see here in the high myope. The the stretch marks of the eye. I like to tell my patients. Stretch marks of the eye. Yeah, that's, yeah. And they good, laugh. Good and they're analogy. Happy, they're mm -hmm. happy those stretch marks don't show. I like that. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> so, yes. So, uh, you know, keep in mind, uh, you know, many of us know from direct ophthalmoscopy that uh, three clicks on a direct ophthalmoscope is about a millimeter change in axial length. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so when you have an average axial length, an A scan of, of a 24 or 24 and a half millimeters in the eyeball, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, if you're uh, eight diopter myope or greater, you might be a 27 or 28 millimeter eyeball. Sure, sure. And uh, so th those folks um, are, you know, still... The majority of them will never get a retinal detachment or mm -hmm. a problem from that, but they have a higher rate. It's and, true. And the longer the globe is and the more aerobic activity they do that might jar the head and the eye, uh, you know, on purpose or, Lord forbid, they're in an accident or something where they, they hit their head. Yes. Uh, you know, they're they're at risk for the, the fragile retina. And, you know, it seems to, for what it's worth, these atrophic tears that occur along the edge of the staphyloma seem to occur. The RPE is hooked down pretty firmly. Um but as you can often see by the scarring here, the black tissue that's been there a while, but the, uh, the, the cilium of the photoreceptors will often tear, leaving the, the outer segment of the photoreceptor embedded in the RPE and the inner segment with the nucleus floating in the vitreous, mm -hmm. where it is dependent entirely on choroidal diffusion to survive. And uh, the peripheral tear um, survives much better than a central one here, like around the optic nerve. Yes, and and the interesting thing that we want want to bring uh, about is just the significant visual field defect uh, that that uh, can happen in high myopia. So if you you can monitor a patient with high high myopia as well as a glaucoma, sometimes it's hard to kind of. Uh, uh, differentiate whether it's from glaucoma or whether from high myopia. And this study here came out uh, not too long ago. They were studying patient with greater than minus eight diopter, and then they monitor their visual field uh, throughout the five year period. And what they found was that uh, for these patients just with myopia, there's actually a progression in terms of visual field loss about like two decibel per year. And that, of course, IBM. decibel being the unit we have on our visual fields when we look at our Humphreys visual fields and they, they have numbers on them, that's for the, they're in decibels. Yes. Right? And I, I, as I recall, the uh, lower the threshold, the higher the number of decibels on the field. So people are in the 30s and 40s. Yes. Uh, that's a very sensitive spot yes. on the retina. Yes, yes, yes. So, so that also kind of bring, uh, in addition to like prone to retinal detachment, also we want to measure, um, monitor about their, their visual field, their vision kind of defect as well. So once a year is, is a good recommendation. So two types of patients today that, uh, that have an enlarged blind spot here. We have the high myope and the pseudotumor or, uh, you know, intracranial hypertension patient that can both... Uh, have have a, a bigger blind spot than we'd expect. Yes. Okay. Let's move on for the next topic. Yeah. So so uh, we're going to talk about uh, Charlton Heston and Ronald Reagan next week. Uh, well, <laughs> well, about two, Alzheimer. Two yes. famous Americans that are yeah. sadly no longer with us, but uh, but but were famous for being some of the first Americans to come out publicly and say that they had Alzheimer's dementia. Yeah, pu so, public figure. Yes. But there's a, there's a role of uh, for the eye care practitioner in Alzheimer. I thought it was just a tough thing to get a visual field on. Yes, but uh, there's actually some development right now uh, with, with possible um, yeah, eye tests to, to help to diagnose uh, Alzheimer's early.
So we'll, we'll look forward to, to, to some of those findings. Marvelous. And, and here's something else that I, I have some expertise on. I used to own a Chromagen uh, fitting set when I practiced in Pennsylvania. Uh, and you can see they come from the UK, but the little picture at the bottom shows us the enhancing patient lives. And the little child there, probably not wearing the Chromagen lenses because he's colorblind. It looks like a different color OD than OS. Uh, blue in the right and maybe kind of a amber mm -hmm, in the left. Mm -hmm, he's mm -hmm. uh, he's doing that because of dyslexia. So there's uh, they, they sell to colorblind people, but uh, but also to dyslexics. We can talk about that next week and, see. and yeah, and the timing's right. School school year just started, right? It did, and they yeah. they have spectacle lenses and contact lenses, and uh, you might want to decide whether it's worth investing in a fitting set. Okay. Till next time. Great. So, so again, please don't use this as medical advice in absence of your your primary eye care practitioner. But I'm Dr. James Kundart. I'm Dr. Lenhua, and we'll see you online. Okay, and record.